Well, thank you very much indeed, Helen. Uh, Provost, it's a great pleasure uh, indeed to be back in Trinity, Dublin. I was, my first visit was actually in 1989 when I came for a job interview in this library. And I'm very sad to say that I was unsuccessful. <laughs> and in the same week, I went up to Edinburgh for uh, an interview in the National Library of Scotland, who did in fact hire me, but, uh, which was a life-changing event in many ways, mostly because I met my wife in Edinburgh. But I do have this tinge of regret, not that I married my wife, <laughs> um, but, of course, um, but that I didn't get the opportunity to live um, in this wonderful country, this amazing city, and to work in the Great Library of Trinity. Uh, and the reason that I was unsuccessful, I put down to the spectacular hospitality that I was shown the night before my interview, <laughs> uh, including the most spectacular pub crawl I think I've ever been on. Um, so that's why I'm staying tonight. Um, uh, I'd also like to pay tribute to our colleagues here in the library. Um, we have the great pleasure of working very closely with you uh, at the Bodleian, not just as a kind of bilateral uh, collaborations, but m most importantly at the moment through our work in the legal deposit libraries with, of course, the British Library, with our other colleagues in the UK. Um, and it's fantastic to see what great emphasis you're placing on the digital future here in Trinity on behalf of your country and as part of the great network of collaborations with the other legal deposit libraries and to Margaret and Arlene and to Christoph as well as to Helen and other colleagues, I'd like to say how much we enjoy working with you. Um, I'm really going to talk about uh, a particular catalyst for change that has happened in my own institution. Um, it's a building redevelopment project which um, has been based um, in the, the buildings in the centre of Oxford that you can see here, I've highlighted them on this slide, which most people think of as the, being at the heart of the university, right in the centre, a series of historic buildings, very famous, you know, Harry Potter's film there and all the rest of it. Um, but they are great research institutions at the same time. And what we've been struggling with is how to adapt and change those buildings to suit the needs of a 21st century research library in a very busy and popular city for tourists at a time when the university itself is changing its own outlook to the rest of the world. And we go back, of course, a long way. For those of you who don't know about the Bodleian, we were founded in 1602, essentially refounding a university library that dates back to the early 13th century. Sir Thomas Bodley was uh, a businessman, but who was also a scholar, who invested his own money in re-establishing uh, the university library. Um, there are beautiful buildings which are, you know, we're, we're very famous for, um, particularly a great historic reading room. It's not on the scale and uh, awesome power of the long room, but it has its own um, great atmosphere and is a kind of an icon for, um, for, for visitors, both academic visitors and the general public. And so maintaining that sense of the library as not only as a, as a place, a historic heritage environment where people like to visit, but also, and most importantly for a university like ours, as an academic destination is absolutely critical to how we go and change and curate those buildings and those spaces. And of course, you know, we're also a famous library for having lots of books deep, rich collections going back uh, centuries, um, medieval manuscripts, you know, collections from all over the world. Um, last year we enjoyed celebrating Magna Carta and we have, we have four of the original engrossments of that document, um, as well as music um, and more recent archives like that of J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, but we're also a network of um, lending libraries, you know, sort of, of modern collections, physical and digital, with a few surprises on the shelves occasionally as well. Um, and the spaces that we occupy over those 30 libraries, departmental and faculty libraries, as well as the historic Bodleian, are also changing. This is the business school library. Um, but one of the key spaces that we occupy right in the center of Oxford has been called the New Bodleian since it was designed and built in the late 1930s. It was built by Giles Gilbert Scott, well, one of the great architects in, in Britain in the 20th century. You might remember his work most 
importantly through the red telephone kiosk. That was one of his designs. But um, for a building in a most spectacular location, it really didn't quite live up to the ancient buildings that surround it. And um, perhaps the most polite thing that I've ever heard said about it was the architectural historian Howard Colvin, who described it as like a dinner jacket made of Harris tweed. <laughs> so fantastic opportunity, but didn't quite live up to it. So what should we do about it? And the most, there were three drivers for this project. Improve the preservation of our historic collections, absolutely number one. You know, we kept the papers of seven prime ministers, all those medieval manuscripts and early printed books. We've got to look after them. But also, the research needs of the university changing all the time. And we have to keep pace with those. We have to provide the facilities for our graduate students and our senior faculty members to engage with that incredible collection. And the third element of this, and we very much consider this as an integrated intellectual whole, is to transform our ability to engage with the public. And so those three things work together. If you look after your collections, you can engage with them through research and teaching spectacularly well. And if you do that, the power of engaging through both the research of the university and its collections is made even more uh, powerful. That's our thesis. Going back to, to preservation, um, I saw this and my, my blood froze um, just over a year ago. This is the, what remains of the Social Sciences Library in Moscow um, for the want of a sprinkler system, um, a catastrophic destru destruction in early 2015. And um, we faced a similar challenge when we began to look at the new Bodleian. It was um, a, a project that I inherited in an earlier form when I joined in 2003, and our vice chancellor in 2005 told us to rethink the project. So the project started off with that preservation piece, um, you know, dealing with the overcrowding of the stacks, the lack of fire security, the lack of compartmentalization. Um, but also, we faced a building that had actually lots of wonderful historic features, even though it was a kind of an art deco building from the 1930s and very unloved and much ridiculed in the university, actually had lots of really beautiful architectural details. But also, um, we really lacked modern facilities to do the other bit, to do the research and the public engagement bit. So this is... Um, a sort of a cue to see a temporary pop-up exhibition of our Magna Cartas that we did at the time that Ross Perot sold his copy in New York in, I think, 2008. And, you know, people were queuing in the cold and out in the quadrangle in the wet, and it really just wasn't very, uh, very suitable at all. And the building that we faced was in this, as I said, spectacular location, right in the heart of Oxford on Broad Street, very, very busy location, but completely closed, completely... Um, uh, in, opaque to the public and even to the students that walk past it. And there were, you would overhear occasionally people say, well, what goes on inside there? And some people said it was, a, uh, it was an electricity substation. Some people said it was a swimming pool. Um, all sorts of wild theories. And so our job was to make it absolutely crystal clear that this was a great research library in a great research university. And so part of the key that was uh, addressed um, by the architects Wilkinson Air of London, who, who won the architectural competition in 2006, was to open it up, to make it transparent, and to invite people in, to make it welcoming, but retain that quality, that rigorous intellectual sense of what the building is about. But in order to do that, there were other changes that were needed. And these were needed anyway, because our storage across the 30 libraries in central Oxford was full. It was over full. It was dangerous. And we had to do something about it. And we decided to build an off-site book storage facility. This isn't rocket science. There are dozens of them in the United United States, the British Library have got their own fantastic facility in Boston Spa, but it was a pretty much a new thing for us in Oxford. And we wanted to move as much of the low-use print outside of the you know, quality 
real estate in central Oxford as we felt that we could uh, sensibly do, um, but to build that offside storage big enough so that we could decant all the collections, about four million of them, in the new Bodleian building to do the, the, the renovation work and then bring some of them back once the, the project is completed. But it actually opened up all sorts of other opportunities as a byproduct, which is making the collection more flexible. So whereas a lot of that print was bound to individual buildings in central Oxford and couldn't easily be moved around, moving it outside of the city's perimeter meant that through a logistic system, we could deliver those books to more of our departmental and faculty libraries and to sort of release the benefit of all that investment over all those years for other parts of the system. So the, we uh, engaged on the project to build uh, uh, what we thought at the time was an 8 million volume uh, storage facility. It ended up, we ended up being able to store more volumes than we thought there. It was a wonderful project. I was um, partly responsible for delivering it. Um, I really enjoyed it. It looked beautiful when it was empty. Um, it looked spectacular. You, know, you could eat your dinner off the shelves. Um, then we had to put books on them, which kind of spoiled it in a way. Um, but actually, it's, it's really wonderful to see um, so much of our um, collection in so much better storage. So the process of moving it off-site meant that we barcoded the volumes. We were able to provide inventory records for all sorts of books that had no catalogue, that we didn't even know existed, like a first edition of Huckleberry Finn, which came through legal deposit in the 1870s, first published in London. I didn't realise that. Um, and my predecessors thought, why do we want this rubbish in our library? Let's just put it on the shelf and not bother cataloguing it. So as we emptied the new book, we found that and 40,000 other books that uh, had been similarly treated. But it meant that we were able to catalogue them. It meant that we put a barcode on them or on their box and put them in this uh, fantastic new facility. Um, it's run in a kind of industrial warehouse fashion, very high standards, uh, very quick delivery. We have two vans a day delivering on average about between one and one and a half thousand books on each trip. We have one delivery on a Saturday. And we had an extraordinary moment when we advertised for a position at the ancient Bodleian libraries, which required a forklift truck license, <laughs> a first for us. We also took the opportunity to make changes to some of the other reading spaces in central Oxford to put more of the high-use material on open shelves and to create more reader spaces and to modernise some of the underground tunnels that link some of our buildings and make them a little bit more Star Trek. Um, and then we began the detailed design process for the new building, thinking about new reading rooms, um, thinking about exhibition galleries, and we had the, this really brought the sort of um, the teenager, the 13 year old out in me, which is working with the architect's model making unit. And this was terrific fun as they had this great team with um, making models using um, computer aided design, using 3D printers, and, and playing around um, with the design process. And then we began. Um, uh, to add to what somebody dubbed the Dreaming Cranes of Oxford. Um, this one um, <laughs> was known as Bodzilla. Um, and the key aspect here was actually removing lots of the structure inside that 1930s building that was unsafe from a fire perspective. So we dig a big pit right down to the bottom of the basement and we also did a very simple thing, which was just to clean the stone. And you can see how grimy and grubby that act, uh, that uh, all the sort of soot and pollution had created on that facade. And just cleaning it has made such an immense difference. And as soon as we took the, the scaffolding off, even though the building wasn't open, people started to think differently about the building. Academics who'd been in Oxford for decades started to think, wow, actually, that's a rather nice building. Can't wait for it to open and see what it's like inside. We also found, as we were removing things like 100 tonnes of asbestos, that there were incredible features like these bronze gates, which had been designed by Giles Gilbert Scott, but had been covered in plasterboard and forgotten. And so we revealed wonderful details inside the building. But we also employed um, bespoke joiners to um, add some contemporary touches, uh, but use, using the same quality. And of course, 
It's not actually a sprinkler system, it's a fine misting system, but it's part of the fire suppression that is at the heart of the preservation piece of this project. Um, uh, my children, when, as they've grown up with this project, have seen me make all sorts of site visits around the world, and most of the pictures I show them from these exotic locations are of shelves. <laughs> They think, oh, Dad, you're so sad. Uh, and, of course, they're right. But, uh, you know, we spent a lot of money on new shelves. It was absolutely critical to look after your collections properly. And uh, they're really nice shelves. Um, so that's the building as it looks now. We removed various 1960s carbuncles that have been bolted onto the uh, outside of it. And most importantly, you can see that we opened up that front facade. We turned uh, a, a wall with pilasters into columns with a colonnade with a glass wall behind it, steps and ramps leading up to welcome the public from the street freely into the building. And that's had an absolutely a dramatic effect. The doors opened um, finally at the end of March last year. We had a queue of readers uh, rather cutely waiting outside to come in and rather cutely they decided to walk across in tandem rather than be have one be in front of another. And inside it looks spectacularly different um, to what it used to be which was just a pretty dusty uh, book stack. Um, and now, of course, it has these big open spaces which allow a light into the building and give you the flexibility inside. Um, we turned a very sleepy reading room. This is called the PPE reading room. I believe the chief executive of the British Library may have spent some time in there. No? Um, uh, well, many of the current members of the cabinet fell asleep over their economics <laughs> textbooks uh, in this room. Um, but we've relit it, we've cleaned the historic woodwork, we've designed new chairs and uh, new, new desks to make it rather more attractive and a very desirable academic destination now. Um, other spaces um, like this have gone through, again, re returning to the clean lines of the 1930s design, lighting it, bringing daylight into the building, um, simple things like this. And, using the opportunity of the change to celebrate it. So Mike was talking about those kind of um, informal rewards to staff. So we've uh, taken every opportunity to pour alcohol through this building. Um, so we, we piped in the first book to come back into uh, the Bodleian. Um, uh, and uh, that started the move of about 40 kilometers of rare books, manuscripts, and archives that have gone back in, which we're still moving at the moment. Um, and of course, many of those books went out to the off-site storage facility like uh, newspapers. But we've begun now to welcome in cohorts of scholars, some of them who were used to using the old facilities, some of them who had no idea that we, we had those and that this was, this was the new normal, as it were. And it's had a tremendous academic impact. We've had um, been able to accommodate research projects, so collaborating with faculty, um, hiring jointly postdocs to work on projects which are library intensive and physically housing them in the new building, uh, starting a visiting fellowship program so that scholars from around the world can come and spend quality time in an interdisciplinary research centre literally inside the library. Um, and then, of course, welcoming the international community scholars into the new reading rooms to have that sort of quiet time. But also through a network of seminar rooms and lecture theatres like similar to this one to be able to engage our collections with teaching and research, seminars, lectures, and the kind of collaborative engagement that the new building uh, can offer. We even had our first hackathon in the library. Um, which was, uh, again, the, the, the sense that our earlier speakers said of the library being an interdisciplinary space. So we had statisticians, computer scientists, physicists, as well as English uh, graduate students come together with Stephen Fry, who um, uh, made some of his own uh, content, his own uh, autobiographical material open source for uh, this, this, this hackathon. And again, being able to have the facilities for the students and little pop-up teams who are working on this project to um, 
practice their presentational skills in the library was an important part of that experience. The Visiting Scholar Centre gives us our faculty and our library staff the opportunity to work very closely with the best and brightest young scholars. The Royal Bank of Canada now fund two postdoctoral visiting fellowships specifically targeted at early career researchers in Canadian universities to give them uh, a, a term, a 10-week intensive immersion in Oxford based in the library. And they've had most fantastic uh, experiences in doing that so far. But partly the building has been designed to support the changing nature of our collections, in particular our special collections. So in 2014 we were given the archive of Oxfam, a great NGO which started in Oxford in the 1940s, a massive archive. They needed the space in an aircraft hangar for a disaster, recover, disaster aid uh, materials, tents and water and so on, rather than storing an archive. So we took that on for them. Um, but so in addition to the paper material, there's lots of digital material and we are curating that and have added these kind of things to our special collections um, through that and other projects. And we're taking that opportunity to um, train a new generation of digital archivists in a program called Skills for the Future funded by the Her Heritage Lottery Fund. And that's proving also fundamental in making that content available for different groups of scholars who would never have thought of themselves as using special collections, certain branches of social sciences, medicine, medical sciences, and uh, the hard sciences. But at the same time of doing that kind of digital preservation, we have a traditional paper conservation laboratory, but that's also becoming increasingly scientifically focused. So we have a conservation science program, we have a head of conservation research, and in addition to doing sort of very traditional, um, very high quality, careful and patient paper conservation um, on things like Islamic manuscripts, we're also using hyperspectral and multispectral imaging techniques to help to understand and prepare and care for some of our great collections in new collaborations with chemists and physicists. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the public impact of the building, and that's really significantly exceeded our expectations. In our business case, we expected 385,000 people to come into the Western Library in its first year. We've ended up um, at the end of uh, April with 885,000 people. We'll be hitting a million some point during the summer months. Um, we've more than tripled our visitors to our exhibition galleries. Um, we've been able to partner with new forms, uh, new uh, cultural activities like the Oxford Literary Festival that now last year held 49 events in the library. Um, and we've hosted a number of national cultural events in Oxford for the first time. So we have this big open space. We held, had some criticism. Why aren't we storing books here? And that's because the books are being used less. They're not we're not getting rid of them, they're not, being, they're not stopping using them, but we felt that it was better to give that space over to people, to research activity and to cultural engagement, and that certainly proved the case. So our exhibition galleries are getting uh, a great deal of attention, and we're asking our faculty to lead the curation of those exhibitions. So they're not just a shop window on our collections, they're a shop window on the research that goes on inside the university. So our current exhibition is on Shakespeare, to English faculty members. Our winter exhibition will be on volcanoes and uh, curated by uh, a scientist in our earth sciences faculty. Um, and we've also tried to think about the public profile of the library as part of the university's um, ambitions to engage more broadly with society. So our Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's Dead exhibition was opened uh, last month by Dame Maggie Smith, who grew up in Oxford and began her acting career in the city. And she was delighted to come back and open that show. But we've also brought technology together with the public. So again, in a collaboration with our computer scientists, on Ada Lovelace Day, um, the, regarded as the founder of computer science and the kind of poster girl for women in computer science, we hosted uh, children 
with our computer scientists to come and learn the basics of coding. And that was a fantastic um, opportunity to see a new generation think of the library as a cool place to be. And not just any old library, a research library. But of course, they're also coming in and doing more traditional things, learning about the past as well. And we're working very closely with the Oxford admissions team to bring school children from schools which have traditionally never sent their students to Oxford uh, to come and spend a couple of days in one of the colleges, work with, in this case, the politics department, but actually as part of that to come into the library to see a 13th century engrossment of Magna Carta and to engage first, you know, close up and personal with these historic documents. And the feedback we got of them was absolutely spectacular. They really, it was, had a very, very high impact on them. We've also been able to get some benefit from a collaboration with Samsung, who provided uh, screens and technology for the new building to help us interact. And we had a, an opening exhibition, which was a, a, a highlight, a real kind of treasure show, which was opened by Stephen Hawking and David Attenborough. Uh, and, and again, a nice little touch, we held a competition for a new reader chair. We discovered through the archives that we'd commissioned new chairs in 1742 and then in 1936. And we decided, well, <laughs> it's about time we commissioned a new chair. So we held a, a competition, and it was won by a very cool London design firm called Barbara Osgaby. And they commissioned a new chair, which we uh, held um, uh, an adopter chair uh, opportunity for alumni. They uh, paid 500 pounds to have a little brass plaque on the back of each of 360 chairs with a message about their loved ones or sometimes themselves. Um, <laughs> Uh, but also, Barbara Osgaby now sell the chair commercially, and we get uh, a share of the, uh, the royalties from each and every one of them sold. So the Western Library has become a cultural hub in the centre of Oxford. Um, we share it with other cultural institutions. We've been able to network and partner. This is uh, a, a thing called the Big Draw, the National Campaign for Drawing, which we held the opening day as the center of a collaboration across the cultural institutions in Oxford. It was the first time the Big Draw had been opened outside of one of the big London institutions. And so that was fantastic. We even had Philip Pullman, who lives in Oxford, being drawn by robots. And, but at the same time, uh, lecture theatre and seminar rooms are being used for proper graduate study research with leading scholars. This is Stephen Greenblatt from Harvard, um, who came last term. We have a digitization centre, of course. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the stuff we're doing in, in the online world. Mike and Rowley have spoken so eloquently about that. I'm running out of time. The final thing I'm going to say is that this project was built on philanthropy. So not a penny of state funding has gone into this building. Uh, we're still arm wrestling with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs over the amount of VAT that we will have to pay. But I suspect the final project cost is going to be somewhere around 80, somewhere probably south of 80 million pounds. Um, uh, the university through uh, the surpluses from Oxford University Press press put 25 million into it. The rest we have fundraised for entirely philanthropically. So we've taken the opportunity to name every single space, apart from the lavatories, <laughs> so far. Um, uh, and you can see the Sassoon Room. This is Blackwell Hall. Um, and we were able to open it just two weeks ago, um, formally, finally, definitively, by the Duke of Cambridge, who um, uh, unveiled a plaque and gave a speech, and most importantly, glad-handed our generous donors. Um, and that's such an important part of our work in the library to uh, raise a, uh, a philanthropic base for the work that we do. But also, the building is used for philanthropic purposes by the whole university now. We have a rooftop terrace which I, I should have had a slide in to show you, which um, now every college head and every department head wants to bring their donors to drink champagne looking across the Dreaming Spires. So using our capital, whether it's the collections, our brilliant staff, or our buildings, for the benefit of the whole university is what this project has been about. We haven't forgotten 
our heritage. The reading room, Duke Humphreys Library, um, is still a reading room. We have not given it over to other purposes. Um, the historic library is still a much treasured academic destination and it will remain so as long as I live and breathe. And we use it again for philanthropic purposes too. Um, but we've been able to reuse some of the spaces. This, uh, this is in the 17th century library, which had been used as a kind of back office function. Um, we've been able to bring our historic printing presses much more accessibly in here. We teach graduate students how books were made in the hand press era. Uh, but we also now use the same facility because it's so much more accessible to bring the public in to, uh, to teach classes for them too. Finally, I think one of the lessons I learned is the importance of marketing. So um, it's something I hadn't really thought about, but our communications team said, look, we really need to put more investment into the marketing. So for the first time, the library had these kind of uh, wrappers on the, the uh, entry gates in the Oxford train station. You know, think of the thousands, of tens of thousands of people every day who put their um, train tickets through those barriers, seeing the advertisement for our exhibitions on there, made us think very, very differently uh, about it. Why have we done this? Fundamentally, it's about sharing what we have. Again, back to Roly and Mike about the openness, about engagement with the world in a different way. Actually, I don't think it is that different. Our founder, Sir Thomas Bodley, in 1602, put above the door that we were here for the whole Republic of the Learned. That, that's what the library was there for. Today, we interpret that phrase, the Republic of the Learned, much more broadly than the university did in the early 17th century, of course. But going back to the 17th century, this is a quote which I think sums up what librarianship is about today. My time is up. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>